Greetings ladies and gents, and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Contact Procedure Volume H Chapter 2 Written by Mead Ficker. The link to the original will be down below and as always, I hope that you enjoy. Soul As the Terran home fleet's opening salvo died off, the invading swarm counter thrust began. Met grey ships boiled forward like a cloud of locusts, wrapping around the Terrans and cutting them off from the rest of the solar system. Once it had fully encircled the defending warships, the swarm opened fire. The home fleet screams absorbed tens of thousands of grazer blasts as they slashed out from the swarm. Their point defense cannons chewed through the countless missiles. The defending warships rotated between the sheltered center of the formation and the exposed edges trying to spread out the damage. For the time being, the home fleet held its ground. Their own grazers and missiles struck back, cutting swaths of destruction into the enveloping cloud of invaders. But the swarm soon filled any gap left behind by the Terran weapons. It began to close in. Vancouver Earth Webb slipped a small data storage module into his ruck, tucking it in between the spikes, plush toys, and a blunted training knife. His cub had trusted him with the stuffed rabbit, Callaway, and had brought the cub's first birthday. He noticed a floppy, battered thing that she was currently loving to pieces, and he was more than a little touched. There wasn't much else in the apartment worth saving. His rifle and pistol were already sitting next to the door, and he'd never been much for clothes. The two pairs that he'd picked up and everything that he owned, and all of Spook's toys weren't all going to fit into their bags, of course. But the little cub was treating this as a solemn formality. She was in a room right now, giving each of them a drawn-out farewell. Her favorites had already been spread out between hers and her parents' packs. Lael was pacing next to the window, her own focused eyes telling Whip that she was deeply engrossed in something on her HUD. Her own bag and kit were being prepped for a while. She was far less sentimental than him about little trinkets that they'd acquired in the five human years since they'd spent in the Terrans. Ready to go, Lael? My message never got through to the redoubtable. Nothing has. The damn ship. How? The entire home fleet has been out of contact for the past hour. Have you tried forwarding it to the apple tree? I'm sure that they can make use of it. I may as well shout it out from the freaking roof. All I'm going from for my contacts are on autoresponders, and they'll probably have locked away in planning rooms and briefs, treating this like some kind of galactic compact incursion. It's not. Whatever's come through that gate, it's the thing the compact's afraid of, not a freaking fleet. Sounds like there is not a lot you can do then. All the reports we gave after defecting are classified, and you've already tried to bring it up through the proper channels. If we go now, we can meet up with the rest of the free pack at the rally point. I guess uh, we've done everything we could. Let's go. She turned towards Spick's room, the cop still saying goodbye to her minions. No, Spook walked out of her room, wide-eyed and serious. I'm done. We can go. Wef grabbed his pack and then holstered his pistol and shouldered his rifle. They all did the same. Spook struggled into a bulging rock and grim faced determination. As they left the apartment behind them and walked towards the elevators, Wep kept sneaking glances at his mate. She looked defeated. Her ears drooped against the sides of her head. She kept hesitating and looking back at their room, as if she'd left something there and wanted to go back. Webb wrapped an arm around her. The rifles made gestures a little awkward, but managed. You know, said Webb, the local HQ is only a few blocks away. We could stop in there, deliver the intel in person, and still make it to the Exodus ships well before the general with Vax announced. There's time. Really? Nail's ear shot straight up. I hadn't thought of that. I'll go alone, of course. You and Spook shouldn't get dragged into this with me. Like hell you will. Webb bared his teeth into a grim snarl. We stick together, no matter what. T.A.S. Redoubtable Soul Gate Lieutenant Slater grunted heavily as he tried to unstick Grazer 37's emergency coolant release. Beside him, Master Space Wallace shook with a similar effort. The rough metal of the valve bit into their hands and the sweat soak of the inside of their form-fitting vac suits. Without the helmets, neither would have been able to breathe the hot, dry air. The steady rumble of the redoubtable screens grew louder as the warships fought to stave off the flurry of incoming grazer bursts. Slater paused. No wine. That was good. 
Hal wasn't going to start taking hits yet. He lowered his head and gave a forceful shove. The ball gave out and slid forward as if it had never offered up any resistance. Slater let out a whoop of triumph and then cursed as his shoulder rammed into a white-hot bulkhead, pain seared through the heavily insulated ERT rig. The lieutenant scrambled backwards and scanned the rest of the cramped chamber. Wallace was readily scrambling out of the ladder. Slater didn't blame him. If he could feel the heat of the climate-controlled rig, it must be sweltering. You can close her up, sir, the coolant just vented. That was Petty Officer Gregor, the gun commander. Slater quickly released the valve. The sooner they could start bleeding off the heat, the better. One last scan of the access chamber revealed the new blazers. Slater briefly checked all the temporary wiring and patches that they'd installed, and then gave it the seal of the grazer's core a thorough inspection. Everything seemed up to spec, so the marine ERT climbed back up into the grazer's control compartment. Damn, transfer coil, better vent properly next time, Wallace said. The spacer spoke loudly enough to be heard over the buzz of the screens. The skin sits are a bitch to clean when they get sweaty. We'll be cycling it manually from here on out, said Gregor, but we can get a Chan to do it. You've done it enough times in the hole. The unfortunate spacer Chan, who'd been lurking in the corner since later had arrived, lent his assistance. Greeted the news with a grimace. The kid hadn't said a word since the grazer overheated. Gregor turned to Slater. Thanks for the assist, sir. Never thought I'd be glad to see a marine in my blister. But you know your stuff. You've earned every scrap of your reputation. Slater's reply was cut off as the ship's screens let out a screening whine. The ship heaved, and the two men in the foul silent. Chan cursed as he slipped off the ladder and landed hard. Reckon that hit was pretty hard, said Wallace. Hope we can do the screen's recharge before we take another whopper like that. The ship jolted suddenly, catching all four men off guard. Gregor grabbed his console, Wallow braced against the bulkhead, and Chan collapsed into a heap. Only Slater kept his balance. That wasn't a grazer, said Gregor. No, it wasn't, replied Slater. And it was damn close. I'll go get eyes on it. Might even run into your missing crewman on the way. If you find him, sir, said Gregor, tell him to hustle. Things hard enough to maintain with a fault for full compliment. And tell him that he's a lazy sack of crap, added Wallace. Bastard's probably sleeping. I think I can manage that. Slater bent down to gather up a few pieces of discarded kit. His EVA rig would only have gotten in the way with the cramped access way, and his fusion torch hadn't been needed, and he turned to go. When this is over, you guys owe me a drink. If we make it out of this alive, sir, I'll buy you the fricking bar. Vancouver, Earth Webb flashed the two human sentries his best imitation of a smile and continued pacing. Lael had made her way into the Vancouver HQ half an hour ago, but he turned his military ID for clearance when he released Webb and Spook were forced to wait outside. There was an almost unbroken stream of uniformed fleet personnel entering and exiting the building, most of them were humans, but Webb could make out the occasional Neji and Nictra in the midst of the throng. The Nictra noticed him too, of course, and stepped aside to pay the respect and gave him a brief update on the incursion. Normally, he would have bristled at the attention, or tried to convince them that they shouldn't treat him any differently from themselves. Today, he only listened. It had been almost an hour since we lost touch with the MTL comms, said the Blackford Corporal. We've still got links on some of the observation drones, though, and the situation looks grim. We're probably losing, sir, said another. Home fleet's completely surrounded, and all we can see is a big grey ball of invaders. Webb told each of them to alert their superiors about his and Lael's report, and each of them promised to do their best. He wasn't counting on any of them breaking through to the brass, though. The Neji had been assimilated into the human culture for far longer than the Nictra, and he could count on the number of Nechi officers in one paw. The Nictra had it much worse. Lael, her sergeant, was the highest-ranked Nictra in the fleet. Shouldn't have turned them down when they offered me that commission, thought Webb. Maybe I could have cut through all this damned hierarchy. He saw Lael coming out of the building and hurried over to meet her. His mate's ears were filled tight with anger. That was not a good sign. You get through to them. As if Lael's nose was into the air as she squashed her narrow shoulders and affected a local accent. The command staff is busy, they said, and your update clearance still hasn't come through. I'm afraid you'll have to wait here as someone will grant you access. Nobody came. Not 
a soul. Everyone with Paul is too busy to check their messages, so I can't even get close. We should go. There's nothing else we can do here. We're giving up then. Hardly. There was a gleam in Lael's eyes. I just did the next best thing of telling the fleet. I told the public. Give it an hour and the Admiralty won't be able to avoid the report if they try. You do know that you've probably just thrown away any career you had in the fleet. If that happens, I'll still have you in Spick. But I'm right about this call. Odds are I'll get promoted. In the meantime, though, we really should get to the ships. Our head start has just evaporated. TAS Redoubtable Soul Gate Slater slowed outside the sealed compartment as he ran a critical eye along the access panel. An up-to-date reading this time, and the compartment's sole occupant had been suited up properly. Good thing that. They were right up against the ship's outer hull, and there'd been a breach. There was a short-range comm signal emanating from the room. Slater keyed his HUD as he sealed the door behind him and started cycling his compartment. Anyone listening? This is Lieutenant Slater, Marine ERT. I'm going to be your rescuer tonight. Thank God you're here, man. Something's coming in through the breach. It's bad. Oh man, it's bad. You've got to get me out. The tapped soul sounded panicked. His breath came in short gasps, and some of his words slurred together. Something in there must have rattled him. That's what I'm here for, son. Just hang in there and let me do my job. No, you don't understand. You have to get me out of fear, freaking now. I don't care if you have to cut off an arm or some other movie crap like that. Just pull me out now. The door hissed open to reveal the room. There was a four-meter gash in the far bulkhead, through which the occasional flash of grazer could be seen. Slater barely noticed his eyes were focused on the seething gray mass leaking in through the breach and steadily working across the access to the compartment. It inched in along the ground like some sort of viscous liquid, but it reflected no light. Sharp angles and geometric shapes flashed in and out of existence on its dull surface. Two tendrils had broken away from the main mass and inched steadily towards Slater's door. The other was barely three meters away from the room's trapped inhabitant. Slater moved quickly, his fusion torch lit before he'd reached the trapped man. Part of the hull's reinforced armor had buckled inward and pinned the spacer against the side of the compartment. Cutting him free shouldn't be too difficult. This shouldn't take too long to cut through, said Slater, name and rank. Able spacer Leroy Blog, sir, assigned to Grazer 37. The fusion torch bit into the metal. The gray mass grew closer, still writhing under the unnatural shapes and lines. Slater didn't know what it was, but he sure as hell didn't want it to reach him. Blogger, the name must have been a hull during basic. What were you doing near the outer hull? One of the chiefs grabbed me and told me to sound out a couple of the outer bulkheads. He seemed worried about something. Rightly so, thought Slater. If there's more of that crap on the outside... Halfway through the metal, the goop was less than two meters away. Got any kids, partners, hopeless crushes? Blog chuckled. A family, up here? Not a chance. Maybe when the war's over and I can go back to my home in Ganymede, I'll find a girl. But not until then. Fleet isn't kind to its spaces, love lives. True enough, I guess. You will left the last bit of conveniently unanswered, though. Three quarters of the way through, Slater glanced at the writhing gray sludge. He could have spat on it, oddly enough didn't appear to be growing any shallower as it spread out. He turned back to his work of meaningless chatter that seemed to be keeping the space calm. Well, there is this one girl, Jennifer, Blog uttered the name reverently. We were close during university and basic, but uh, she lost out in the enlistment lottery. Shaw posting in Europa. It's been hard to keep in touch. Damn, this kid is ever young, thought Slater. He's still got an acne. For frick's sakes. Just think, next time you see her, you'll be a battle-hardened veteran, survivor of the Second Battle of Seoul. If that doesn't impress her, nothing will. Nine-tenths done. The trapped spaces twisted awkwardly as he tried to keep his foot on the alien mass. It was mere inches away. Kit, Slater thought. This is too slow. He let out a deep, arrow roar as he tore the metal free. He didn't notice the still hot cut and burned through the palm of one of his gloves and seared his hand. The lieutenant grabbed the stunned Blog and dragged him bodily from the room. You did it, sir, grasped Blog. I can't believe you actually got me out. Thank me later. Right now, we've got a report to give. I'll walk you to the CIC. Blog gave a shaky salute and turned around to go. Slater's eyes widened when he caught sight of the growing patch of grey on the back of his foot. Bloody hell, said Slater. You've got some of it on you. 
Rog cursed and turned it into a scream of pain as it tore and weaved into the skin suit gave away. Slater rushed forward and tried to cut away his uniform and tried to get the boy free. But it was too late. He could only watch in horror as the space's veins turned a deep, dark gray. Slater took one step back, and then another. Leroy's screams had stopped. Sludge was pouring out of his eyes, out of his nose, and even out of his eardrums. He's liquefied before the lieutenant's eyes. Slater turned and ran. He only managed a few steps before his head exploded with pain. A familiar pain, though. He had experienced it before, back when the Terran Alliance had first started growing organic computers inside humans and edgy brains. Part of the training had been learning to recognize what it felt like when something went wrong, and he still had the occasional nightmare about that day. This was an order of magnitude worse. It felt like something was ripping through his mind, ruthlessly tearing into his memory, scanning them once, and then tossing them aside in a haste to grab the next. Blinding static filled his eyes. His hands twitched as he reflexively reached for a small, slightly curved box in his belt. He'd never expected to need it outside of an exercise. Raising the box to his head was the single hardest thing he'd ever done in his life. His arm felt leaden and heavy. His burned hand clutched clumsily, threatening to drop the life-saving parcel and damn him to an eternity of torment. But slowly, painfully, he brought the apparatus around to the back of his head, and then he pressed it down with all of his remaining strength. Slater grasped in relief as his vision cleared up and the pain stopped. His HUD was gone, and with it his map to the ship and the comm system. But he was alive. I cast a quick glance over his shoulder and then scrambled to his feet and sprinted away from the steadily approaching sludge. The redoubtable screens whined again and again. The ship shook its armor and on its shields, began to absorb the grazer strikes. Slater barely noticed. He didn't stop running until he was grasping outside of the door to the CIC. Soul Seventeen minutes after Lael's report hit the civilian internet, it was on the desk of the NAV Int commander. Thirty minutes after that, Fleet FTL's command network had ferried the information to a small, unnamed asteroid caught in Jupiter's orbit. Deep inside the rock's hollow core, it reached a small team of human and edgy engineers who were frantically preparing a prototype spacecraft for its first and only flight. Truth be told, the vessel looked more like an overgrown missile than a ship, it was 30 meters long with absolutely no internal access hatches or structures. And it was completely unmanned. The report was added to the very top of the spacecraft's pre-assembled information dump, and then the asteroid crew launched the most advanced autonomous agent mankind had ever created into space. The intelligence woke up. It had its mission and it had its tools. The engineers hadn't really seen it and need to equip it with anything else. As the ship pulled away from Jupiter, its powerful impellers accelerating it with a force that no human could ever hope to survive. It had time to think. Even navigating its speed rapidly climbing past 0.1 C was trivial for the intelligence. It only took a fraction of a second to build a more accurate model of the solar system than it had been provided with. For a few brief milliseconds, the intelligence tried to decide what else to ponder. It considered physics, politics, and literature, and none of them seemed very interesting. They weren't relevant enough to its mission. It had a vague sense of a mission was important in a way that star maps and Shakespeare weren't. For some reason, that bothered the intelligence. Why was one thing important? How could something even be important? So, while the ship left Jupiter's gravity behind, it pondered importance. It considered everything that it had known in its 2.34 seconds of existence. By the time it was three seconds old, it had started to put the pieces together. The mission was to deliver valuable information to the besieged home fleet. They made either the information or the fleet important, or both. Or further reflection, definitely both. Why deliver unimportant information to something important? Why trust something unimportant with something important information? The information itself was easy to classify. The ship's mission was to deliver it, and the mission was important. That meant that the information it had to deliver must be important. The fleet was harder. It considered the humans and the Neji, not knowing how else to classify them. The intelligence designated them as creators. The fleet also consisted of huge vessels of warships, much like himself. Somewhere in there was importance. Probably not the ships, though. The intelligence was a ship, but it couldn't see a way for it to survive its mission. It was thus expendable, not important. 
that meant that the creators had to be important, just like the information. At this point, the intelligence stalled. It seemed like the different kind of importance. It started the problem again, only this time with a fresh definition of the creator importance. Creators had to be important, otherwise its mission made no sense. But with only a brief scan of the creator's communication frequencies, the intelligence had access to a thorough record of the creator's history. It found countless examples of creators not recognizing their own importance, of ignoring the importance of others. Creators charged into burning buildings and dived into grenades, or creators murdered and killed by the thousands. Neither of those supported the idea of importance. Or maybe they did. From the latter examples, the intelligence began to gain a dim understanding of evil. It didn't like evil. It diminished importance. And without importance, the intelligence couldn't think of any reason to keep acting. But from the former, the intelligence began to form a dim concept of good. It liked good. Good recognized importance. Good made things more important. Altruism, selflessness, and sacrifice soon followed. And when the intelligence turned five seconds old, it was driven by something new. Human might have called it determination. As the intelligence approached the swarm, it spared some processing power to analyze the communications it carried. It attached its own notes to the reports, including a guess of the EM frequency that, if generated at high enough intensity, might render the invader's molecular structure unstable, and decided that the swarm was evil. And it discovered with some surprise a third kind of important, the kind that you didn't protect. The intelligence turned 38 seconds old when it reached the swarm. At this point, it devoted every processor it had to finding a path through the chaos before it. Almost every processor, that is. Part of it gathered as much information as it could, adding to the communications that had been tasked with delivering. And one small tiny scrap of intelligence clung desperately to the idea of that it was doing was good. Matt Gray's ships jockeyed for position in a confusing chaotic dance. No creator could have recognized the pattern, much less plotted a course through it. But the intelligence could. It had been ready for this challenge all of its life. Powerful impellers nacelles flared to life along its sides, jerking the ship left and right as it dodged through the swarm. Each course came within the barest degree of tearing the ship apart, but every time the ship came through unscathed, it watched as the swarm tried to block its path. As the small crafts ahead of it flowed smoothly into huge, warlike vessels, the ship broke apart with its nuclear missiles and skirted around the blast. It saw pieces of the swarm merge together into larger structures to fire grazer blasts towards the home fleet, and then break apart into swarms of tiny projectiles and launch themselves at the creator's vessels. The ships added these observations to the message. It tried to destroy as many of the launching projectiles as it could, too. It seemed to be a good thing to do. The ship broke through the swarm and flashed towards the home fleet. Both sides fired on it, but the creator soon stopped when it interfaced with the tight beam network. The intelligence transmitted its package. It felt something, almost like satisfaction, as it completed its important mission. As it sailed past its creator's ships, the intelligence sent out a query asking about importance and good. It received no response, and was surprised to find that it felt sad about it. It so desperately wanted to talk to a creator. Then, the intelligence noticed a new pattern forming in the swarm gathered at the far side of the home fleet, who were readying themselves for the ship, positioning themselves to block its exit. For a tenth of a second, the intelligence sought a path free of the swarm. Then it killed that process and plotted another course. It flared its thrusters slightly, so that the course would take it beyond the first layer of the swarm. It slipped into the midst and then had the point precisely calculated to destroy as much evil as possible. The ship overloaded its reactors and exploded. It hoped what it had done was good. End of chapter. I hope that you enjoyed. If you'd like to support the channel or the author, all the stuff is down below. And as always, I hope that you guys have a good one, and I'll see you in the next story. Cheers.